Good morning, and thank you for joining our roundtable discussion. Our session will draw on the history of black political economy and brings together black economists who are doing pioneering research on black cooperation and cooperative economic systems in the United States. There is a long history of African Americans who examine the benefits of economic cooperation in production and consumption for African American communities, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Sadie Tanner Marcel Alexander, and Sam Meyer Sr., and economists such as Lloyd Hogan, who articulated the principles of black political economy needed for building black economic cooperation. In our own lifetime, Jim Stewart established a foundation for the benefits of cooperation when he published an article in 1984 in the Review of Social Economy called Building a Cooperative Economy, Lessons from the Black Experience. Jim is the foremost scholar in the US whose expertise spans and combines the fields of black studies and economics. In the article, Jim discussed historical cooperative efforts by black Americans to build an economic system that embodied solid, solidaristic principles. His aim was to show how economists can refine notions of solidarity and social justice through a detailed analysis of the black experience. This session's three other panelists demonstrate alignment with Jim's goal and have published formative articles in the Review of Black Political Economy. And for reference, you would take a look at Haynes and Gordon Nemhart, 1999, and Banks in 2020. Indeed, the Review of Black Political Economy has been at the forefront in publishing scholarship on the black cooperative tradition in the US. The panel revisits Jim's lessons by discussing cooperation and cooperative economic systems within black American communities as a means for addressing persistent racial disparities while generating opportunities for shared prosperity. Curtis Haynes, Jessica Gordon Emhart, and I were contemporaries while students at UMass Amherst, while graduate students at UMass Amherst. Like Jim, we are part of a school of thought within black political economy that seeks a transformation of the economy so that it better serves the needs of people and the planet through policies that are sustainable, equitable, and democratic. Our research is as much about reclaiming and recasting African American economic history and thought as it is about generating black economic empowerment. We hope that our panel leads to a renewed focus on black cooperative economic systems and new areas of scholarship on the topic, as well as efforts to bring these ideas to fruition. We will present in the order in which panelists are listed in the program, starting with Jim Stewart. Each panelist will talk for approximately 15 minutes. Afterward, we will have a roundtable discussion among panelists, followed by a Q&A with the audience participants. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, but I have mixed uh, emotions because you said I wrote this in 1984. I must have been in elementary school. <laughs> 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 but uh, seriously, uh, I believe that the conditions uh, in the domestic and global economy as well as the political climate are ripe for us to have a renewed black cooperative movement. And so that's the context in which uh, I'm going, going to try and think, think a little differently about my work. The model that I'm going to present, and you saw, saw the title of it, really is what I call a logic model as opposed to the type of theoretical model that we usually see in economic papers. And what that means is I don't just talk about uh, the theory. What I talk about is how do you operationalize it. And I give some examples in the paper about of institution, cooperative institutions and CDCs that are currently implementing aspects of the model. Um, as, as I indicate in this slide, I'm drawing on a lot of different sources here. Uh, my original piece, one of the things that I did in that piece was to focus a lot of attention on community development corporations and the work that Leon Sullivan did in Philadelphia through the black church. Uh, Sullivan initiated what was called the 1036 program where he asked his parishioners to, uh, to contribute $10 over 36 months to try and build some cooperative institutions. 
He used a very comprehensive model that involved both business development as well as sort of manpower development and other types of social services. And he also founded what was called Operation uh, Opportunities Industrialization Centers, which was a major manpower program that at one time had 164 affiliates across the country. Now, in, in Philadelphia, Sullivan established what was called Progress Enterprises, which was the business side of what he, what he put together. And they had a bakery store, laundry, other types of small retail operations. And at one time, there were actually 400 churches in Philadelphia that participated in the movement. So it was clearly possible to scale up a cooperative movement. And again, uh, as Patrick was talking to me earlier, the, the black church can again play an important role in this whole process. Um, I sort of put aside uh, some of this work after 1984. I was tired, you know. And so I, and, but Jessica uh, Gordon Nimhard and Curtis Haynes, in particular, have really uh, sort of picked up the torch and have done amazing work. You, you probably have seen uh, Jessica's book, Collective Courage, and Curtis will talk about what he's been doing in Buffalo State, and his team is here, and I had the opportunity to meet them earlier. It's really been on the ground in terms of implementing a lot of these activities. So what I tried to do in terms of updating my thinking from 1984 was to look at what's been happening around the world. And uh, surprise, surprise, the cooperative movement has been growing leaps and bounds outside the United States, particularly in developing countries, but also in developed countries in Europe and so forth. And the UN has put forth the model of the circular economy, and I'll, I'll show a slide that, uh, of what they're t talking about in the circular economy. And their model focuses to a large extent on sustainable e economic systems. Now, I didn't want to be, uh, be the old guy in this presentation, so I went back 10 years before I, I presented and went back to a model by June Hopps called Link Cluster Economic Development, uh, which appeared in the Review of Black Political Economy in 1974. Now, one of the interesting things about June Hopps is that June Hopps is not an economist. June Hopps is a social worker, and she's still employed at Boston University in, a, uh, in, in an endowed chair, so, she, so she's older than me. <laughs> and the last point, part of this, of, the, of my implementation strategy, focuses on the contemporary reparations movement as a mechanism to try and implement some of these ideas. Um, you may not know that there are 160 different uh, reparations movements across the country, and, and all of these movements involve some type of demand for funds to, to implement some form of restitution, reparations or however you want to describe it. And what I'm trying to do is to, if any of you went to the lecture yesterday, um, uh, what I'm trying to do is much what, what the, our presenter was trying to do, and that is to edit institutions in ways that will maximize the, uh, ex the, the possibility of CDCs and co-ops being successful. So a couple of, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the motivations for uh, what, what I'm trying to do. One is that the initial CDC movement actually emerged out of Sullivan's work. That Sullivan was the initiator of, of that whole project. And there are currently still 4,500 CDCs in the United States. But the number of CDCs has been declining pr primarily as a result of the pan pandemic. Uh, secondly, it, it's clear to me, and I, I have this quote uh, from, from Jessica and her, and her co-author, um, about the extent to which racial capitalism seems to be in crisis. And, 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 and guess who are the pr pr uh, primary victims of that crisis? Um, you know, Jesse Jackson used to say, it's not justice, it's just us. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the motivations. As I mentioned earlier, another motivation is the UN model of the circular economy. And this is simply a uh, diagram that illustrates how all the pieces are fit together in terms of trying to emphasize renewables, uh, and you, you, know, you can Google the, the circular economy. There's, there are three or four different position papers that various UN offices have put out. And, um, and again, if you look at the literature in the Review of Black Political Economy in the early 1970s, a lot of it was talking about circular eco the circular economy, the extent to which funds uh, stay within the community, circulate in, throughout the community before they leave. And this is essentially some of the same ideas that are built into the circular economy model of the UN. Now, even though it's focusing primarily on sustainability, 
there are a number of papers that are, have pointed out that African American communities and, and Hispanic communities are disproportionately vulnerable to climate change issues. So there's a, that type of connection that's also uh, important. The June Hops Link Cluster Development Model. Essentially, again, what you see here is she, a Minority Economic Development uh, Commission, Development Bank, Division of Economic Planning, so a lot of administrative apparatus, uh, lo local working groups that are working in different areas. And these clusters were really sort of uh, networks of businesses. So her model focused primarily on businesses, and she has a couple examples in there. One is, is sort of aut automobile related, so automobile repair, dealerships, so on and so forth, that are connected through uh, uh, various types, types of networking. So I, what I'm doing is sort of using the same idea of clustering, but in a very different sense. So here's, my, here's, here's the model. And essentially, what I'm suggesting is that the Institute on Race, Power, Political Economy, based at the New School, and the NEA, NEA and BERC, and BERC, which I control, NEA I don't, would, would be involved in working with local commissions that would involve, that would be looking at how do we try and maximize the uh, well-being of residents in a particular community. And in the, this is particularly central because the goal is really to maximize the, uh, the, the overall well-being of people as opposed to simply their uh, fiduciary or pecuniary outcomes. So this committee, if, again, if you were at the, at the uh, discussion yesterday, our speaker emphasizing voting as a mechanism to, by which you can try and achieve consensus. So you can think of this as being sort of a committee that would, in fact, be uh, l l l vetting different types of proposals that would be coming forth that had already been seen as being economically viable by the commission to see whether or not the values embedded in there and the outcomes are consistent with the UN values and, uh, and some of the other aspects of the solidarity economy. And then I focus on four different areas, housing, health care, food justice, and, and business. And I'm going to just, give, we're, li we're limited to 15 minutes, so I'm going to simply show what some of the, the, of the, of the activities that would be involved in each of these. So the commission itself would work directly with financial institutions. That we've, uh, there was been some presentations yesterday that talked, talked about community-based financial institutions as being critical. Community benefits agreements. Um, I, I moved. I, I lived in Pittsburgh. The, as an example, the Hill District that got decimated by the urban renewal in the 1950s signed a <coughs> CBA, C, a community benefits agreement, with the Pittsburgh Penguins that required them to commit money to reconnect the Hill District to the downtown of Pittsburgh. There are a lot of CBAs in, in, in existence around the country, so I'm advocating increasing those. Community land trusts, which are, in, in my estimation, increasingly important because you've got a lot of vacant land, particularly in urban areas, that's underutilized. And community land trusts can be a vehicle by which you can ensure that that land is used more, more productively and to keep developers from coming out, increasing gentrification, and so on and so forth. The Social uh, Capital Generation Preservation Assessment Committee is going to look at ways of again, of looking at how we can implement the social solidarity values in the human rights economy co uh, components, uh, focus particularly on the plight of black youth, baby bonds, of course, that's one of the, pro of the projects that uh, Derek Hamilton and, <clears throat> and, and uh, Sandy Darity have, have been pushed, and uh, to focus on environmental protection and sustainability. And again, we know that uh, black and brown communities in urban areas are subject to heat deserts and other types of uh, environmental uh, challenges. The housing development, there's possibilities in the H existing HUD regulations that allow you to convert HUD, HUD subsidized housing into cooperatives. And I ha haven't seen much uh, uh, use of those particular provisions, but again, that's something that I would expect this particular com com uh, network to do. There's some new policies that were in, in, uh, implemented in 2023 that provide funding for the repair of existing affordable housing and construction of new housing. That's one of the things that this group would do. And then one of the principal activities, of course, would be to fight gentrification. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Harlem lately or, or, or D.C. And uh, you know you, you know what I'm talking about. Food justice, CDCs, and co-ops. Um, you know, we, we, ha we have a lot of food deserts, so we're going to try to combat supermarket redlining, urban agricultural products, uh, uh, pro I'm sorry, projects. Uh, there are a lot of those underway down in the Miami area in, in Florida. Direct connections between farmers and consumer food cooperatives. One of the projects that I'm working on, not through BERC, involves working with black farmers in the northern uh, Florida area to try and get them to consider using some of their land for agrivoltaics. Uh, so there's, so there's, there's a lot of opportunities there, but that's also going to require some, uh, some human capital development in that particular field. Healthcare CDCs and co-ops, again, there's a federal program that these, com these particular uh, networks can, can, can access, the HRSA Health Center program, which is co for cooperatives can operate through those. And we can also use telehealth. You know, when I had COVID, uh, I, I, I was out of town, so I had to use telehealth, and, 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 and it worked fine. And we can do that at a lower cost than we can in terms of in-person visits and so forth. Uh, CDC business enterprises, during the pandemic, we lost a lot of black-owned businesses, and a lot of those were sole proprietorships. So one of the things I'm proposing is that uh, we use existing legislation that allows you to convert sole proprietorships into cooperative enterprises. And in the paper, I provide the, the documentation for the existence of those. Implementation strategies. Okay, first of all, I need some buy-in from, from the organizations that were at the top of my, of my di diagram. And so what I'll be doing uh, subsequent to this is talking to uh, Derek at, at the Institute to get his buy-in and uh, hope talk to the NEA board and, and my board at BERC about whether or not this seems like something that we ought to pay a lot of attention to. Then I want to disseminate a, a refined and slick presentation of the model through CDC networks and co-ops to see if the, how much interest there is and whether or not we can identify pilot areas that would in fact be interested in undertaking uh, the edit type of editing that I'm proposing. And thirdly, the a African American Redress Network is, uh, keeps track of all the reparations proposals around the country. And so I want to disseminate the, the, the model through those to, to try and get them to edit their uh, demands that are being put forth for reparations and restitution. Uh, and to get them to include funding for this type of editing is part of their demands. Um, then I, again, hopefully we can identify pilot locations that will be willing to implement aspects or all of the model. So the two different aspects of this editing, one would be the actual sort of cluster model in terms of where you're networking different aspects of the, uh, of the model. And what I'm hoping is that individuals be willing to, to, to uh, participate in more than one cluster. So as an example, both housing and health care, and we can then be able to uh, hopefully get uh, increased outcomes. And then finally, hopefully at some point in the future, uh, after I get out of, of uh, high school, uh, we'll be able to refine the framework and get a national movement. So, so that's, my, that's my presentation. I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I, I've been asked to sort of give a, a little, a little de a definition of what we mean by cooperatives, so I'm, I'm going to read a, a little bit from, from the paper. Uh, so so uh, cooperatives include organizations and enterprises such as mutual associations, community organizations, self-help groups, consumer groups, associations of formal and informal workers, fair trade, solidarity financing, and community saving schemes. Cooperatives are generally guided by seven cooperative principles. One, voluntary and open membership. Two, democratic member control. Three, member economic participation. Four, autonomy and independence. Five, education. Six, training and information. And seven, cooperation, to, cooperation among cooperatives and concern for community. The two kinds of uh, cooperative advantages to cooperatives generally one derives from the nature of cooperatives as 
member or, as member-owned businesses, and particular ones derived from specific types of uh, co cooperation. So as an example, consumer cooperatives uh, are, provide benefits because they provide people with consumption goods at the lowest possible price and with a guarantee of good value, and so make their income go further. Producer cooperatives enable self-employed people and family businesses to gain the strength and, and numbers they need to survive in the market. Worker cooperatives provide people with an income, but also are a way of gaining control over the conditions under which they uh, labor, providing decent work. And there are other types of cooperatives as well, but that's sort of a general overview. Thank you, Doctor. Um, what I'd like to do is just say uh, thank you uh, for everybody who's on the panel. Um, and I'm honored to uh, participate in this historic event, bringing the attention to black political economy and cooperative economics. Uh, many of you kn may know that uh, Dr. Uh, Gordon Emhart, in her opening pages of Collective Courage, dedicated her book to me. And a few, few of you may wonder, uh, who's this guy? Uh, <laughs> who's this guy uh, um, that she's given such high praise? Um, and, I, and thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, but first, before I introduce myself, uh, let me introduce my team. There's, I have a team right here who came with me from uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, they're part of our Leadership Academy in Community Building Economics, and their specialization is that they are um, the, the social media club. All right, so you see cameras around. My, my social media club is around here taking, taking these videos, okay? Um, so again, as uh, Nina was saying, um, myself and Dr. Jessica gordon Emhart and uh, Dr. Banks, we graduated from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, during a time when UMass was considered a Shangri-La, right, um, and the Department of Economics was known as a Harvard for Marxists. We were members of a third world caucus, uh, a loose collective of economic graduate students. Uh, we communed over potlucks, breaking bread, discussing philosophy, race and class, and the meaning of life, and our role in it. And at university, we studied hard, and along the way, we challenged the implied privileges of curriculums taught from a non-critical Eurocentric perspective, impervious of the conversations being discussed regarding economics from the perspectives of Africans, Asians, Latin Americans, and even us as black Americans in North America. It was during this time that I met Lloyd Hogan, who was teaching at Hampshire College, also in the Happy Valley. He eventually became an outside reader of my dissertation, um, although his black political economy principles were at the core of my dissertation. My dissertation, an essay in the art of economic cooperation, cooperative enterprise and economic development in black America, defended in 1993, was a review of W.E.B. Du Bois and his ideas of the cooperative commonwealth, worker ownership, and the consideration of the Mondragon cooperative system in the Basque lands of Spain as a model that, be, that could be relevant in black communities in the United States. After a brief stint at Skidmore College and, and being on the job, job market, I accepted a position at Buffalo State College, currently Buffalo State University, linked uh, to an urban mission. Um, and then I shuffled on to Buffalo. Uh, you know that story, right? Shuffling on to Buffalo. Um, wanted to implement what I had learned in the academic environment, I became a scholar activist. And along with a team from Buffalo State, we received HUD funding and participated in a neighborhood-based effort to establish a hybrid community worker-owned cooperative supermarket on the east side of the city, one of the most segregated cities in the nation. The outcome, the result of political jockeying, culminated in the top supermarket on Jefferson Avenue. On May 14th, 2022, a white nationalist, domestic terrorist, a young man filled with hate, targeted this same neighborhood because of his high concentration of black Americans. In Topps parking lot and in the store, he killed 10 and wounded others, some of whom, some of whom I knew and some of them who were peers of my 85-year-old mother. 
On that eventful day, my team, some of them who are here right now, we were offering at the local community uh, a prosperity summit as part of a seven-week series in economic and financial literacy. We let out a little afternoon, and many of us congregated in the, in the parking lot. Less than an hour later, bullets flew from a semi-automatic weapon fired at any black man, woman, or child moving. Debriefing later, a team member noted that we were not just Dr. Haynes, scholar activist and entourage. At 1 o'clock p.m. on May 14, 2022, we were targets. Hating the bad, loving the good. We could hate the bad, but my team and ourselves, we choose to love the good. The history of race violence in America and across the planet is long and extensive. The thesis of Hogan's work and those on this panel is that the dominant paradigms in economic thought do not have a well thought out understanding of this history and its impact on generational wealth built from the toils of black Americans for years, decades, and centuries. And the link of generational poverty most evident in many segregated black communities in the United States and throughout Africa and the African diaspora. Lloyd Hogan. This is Lloyd Hogan, my mentor in the field of economics. He worked from the thesis that black, Amer black Americans are no different than any other population of people. He was inspired to respond to the absence of any significant economic analysis over and beyond just a compiling of facts and figures and a straight jacket approach to economic policy. He laid out a brilliant political economic analysis synthesizing the works of Adam Smith, Karl Marx, and W.E.B. Du Bois. Lloyd Hogan is one of the greatest economists that most have never heard of, let alone study. Hogan defined political economy as a study of a human population undergoing the act of social reproduction over a protracted period of time under a set of rules promulgated and enforced by a political state within a bounded geographical domain. I know it is a mouthful, but it is the foundation of an analysis applied to an artificially created black population, subaltern, as Dr. Gordon Embard would describe. This population bounded together through a long common history of being free men and women on the African continent with their way of life disrupted by a holocaust of slave trade, the middle passage and hundreds of years of chattel slavery, freed through their efforts and others, caught up in a new form of bondage called sharecropping, and again freed from their efforts and others, arriving in a political economic system of capitalism, primarily as wage laborers with very little opportunities to spin off a capitalist class in an environment of separate and unequal. Years ago, arriving in Buffalo, New York, I accepted the challenge to participate in an urban mission. Over time, I became seasoned, growing, with growing from an enthusiastic uh, recent PhD, wanting to apply my work in cooperative economics in the beginning, and I st that I started out wanting to understand, in the, in the beginning, I started, to, started out wanting to understand why black Americans from the communities that I lived in were relatively poor and why poverty and lack was so prevalent in so many of these segregated neighborhoods. Hogan's black political economy gave me the means. His inspiration and his call to action became, for me, the bridge from scarcity to abundance. At the end of his book, Hogan made the call. This is the bridge. He said, in sum, black Americans stand at the threshold of a worldwide social revolution. Their unique history of suffering and struggle for survival places them in an unparalleled position to be exemplars to the rest of the exploited people of how a new social order can be conscientiously fashioned to reflect the perfectibility of the human condition on Earth. In application, what I have learned was that the cooperative principle, principles were not the goal. They were a practice. They were a tool. And during the days of our market, I realized that we can teach techniques and skills, but what was more important was a, the su supreme significance associated with communication skills with self and with others. And this is how I arrived at the work of Bob Proctor and Earl Nightingale. I learned that one cannot find health through studying disease, one cannot find abundance by studying scarcity, and one cannot find wealth by studying poverty. 
As an economist, it has become clear that the importance of a paradigm shift in economic theory with a corresponding shift in policy and practices is necessary. The dominant paradigms in economic thought, such as neoclassical, Keynesian, and even Marxian economics, are all steeped in a Eurocentric scarcity consciousness that cannot solve neither the economic securities of the neighborhoods I live in, nor the global insecurities facing the 21st century global population of all race, creeds, and color. Recognizing that these theories, policies, and practices are social constructs, I present an alternative inspired by Lloyd Hogan, a bridge from scarcity of abundance for all people. The bridge. Change your paradigm, change your life. We're changing our paradigm from economics of scarcity to economics of abundance. The bridge. You become, Earl Nightingale wrote a book called The Strangest Secret. The strangest secret is you become what you think about. Some of the language of this alternative paradigm. Um, one that I picked up myself was this idea of ikigai, doing what you love to do, doing what you're good at, and making your contribution to a greater good and getting paid for it. Some of the other language, visualization, imagination, intentionality. Also important, your, your most important attitude is your attitude towards self. And that's something that I really discovered when I was working in the cooperative movement um, with our market. We, we taught the skills, right? We taught the technique, but what was really missing is that, that piece of really understanding self and the attitude towards self. Let me just hit up on a couple of points that I wanna share with, with regard to this paradigm shift. Paradigm shift in economic theory, paradigm shift in economic policy, paradigm shift in economic practice. And let me just say, again, my social media team designed this PowerPoint presentation, and I'm just gonna hit on a couple of the points on each one of these slides, but you can access this whole PowerPoint if you go to our website, cigbuffalo.com, um, and uh, just, and while you're there, subscribe, all right? Please subscribe. I know Jasmine told me to doc, make sure you ask, tell them to subscribe, okay? All right, so principles of black political economy, a, a paradigm shift in economic thought. Probably one of the most important things that I would like to say about this shift in economic thought is that Lloyd Hogan taught me and taught us to shift our analytical emphasis away from the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services to focus on the human being and the possibility and the probability of human perfectibility. Cooperative economic policies. Right? Again, cooperative, the way we look at it, the way we're working from it, is that cooperative economics is a policy prescription associated with black political economy. Probably the most significant part on this particular slide is that cooperative economics can be considered as an alternative to neoclassical laissez-faire economics, Keynesian counter-cyclical policy, or even, even Marxian class antagonisms. We talk about the idea of the financial sector with non-extractive financing and lending without credit scores. Government sector, as Dr. Stewart was, was presenting, right, favorable legislation supporting democratic enterprise, and then monetary policy. This is important. I'm, I'm being told to move on, right? But I don't know how many of you have heard about Bitcoin, but we're using Bitcoin in our analysis. Bitcoin, we feel, is a, is a an appropriate tool that fits with our work in cooperative economic development. Community building. Um, probably here, what's probably would be most significant in this particular slide is the idea of the mastermind as a superior form of pedagogy and also economic and financial literacy um, in neighborhoods and schools. My team right here, we're part of the Leadership Academy of Community Building Economics and we consider the academy as a dojo, a training hall, a place where pioneering people come to polish their spirit. The principles of black political economy, when we put it all together, the value of principles live in their proper application. This is how we apply it. We understand that the cooperative commonwealth is best built from the ground up. My team right here, um, we have gotten together and we have built a cooperative 
real estate corporation, holding and management corporation. The theme and the mission of that cooperative is cooperative ownership of generational wealth. Now, what's important to realize is that wealth is a social construct. And we're kind of paying attention to, again, being versed in Western civilization, Western thought, we look at wealth in terms of stuff, in terms of things. But from our perspective, we understand wealth from the first principle, from the principle of love. We also look at life wealth from the perspective of, in our particular work, building seven generations into the future, starting with our own. The idea is, again, that wealth is a social construct. We have a choice to make it material, or we have a choice to make it human. So, in my conclusion, this whole presentation on my part, for all of us, um, in memory of a revolutionary and a pioneer in economic thought, Lloyd Hogan. Okay. So if you want to get in contact with any of our team, and again, my team, thank you so much to come from coming from Buffalo, um, that flight. Um, I'm glad we're done, for my part. I, if, uh, if you want more information, we got a, you can scan the barcode, or you can contact us at CIGBuffalo.com, CIGBuffalo at gmail.com, or call us at 716-390-0572. Okay, oh, thank, thank you. you. Good morning. I guess it's still morning, right? <laughs> I'm here to um, sum up a little bit, like look forward and look backwards, so making sense of centuries of African American economic cooperation, black American economic cooperation. You can see why I um, dedicated the book, which I'll talk about in a minute, <laughs> to Curtis because of all the work he actually introduced me to this notion of economic cooperation and black co-ops. But first, an acknowledgement to our ancestors, to the land, and to Mother Earth. So just remembering the original stewards of the land and the need to honor treaties, acknowledging Mother Earth and our efforts to keep her sustainable, acknowledging the African origins of humanity, uh, the consequences of racial capitalism and settler colonialism, and then uh, acknowledging our struggles, but also our victories, our resistance. And that's um, why I actually started focusing on economic cooperation, because I was tired of all the gloom and doom um, and wanted to make sure we looked at the ways that we have agency and have uh, asserted agency throughout our uh, time here, especially on, in North America, but also to understand the roles of mutual aid and economic cooperation toward liberation. So. Um, my research on black American co-ops would never have been done or been published without the work of Jim Stewart or Curtis Haynes. Um, Curtis Haynes, as you see with his dissertation, when I was ready to receive that information, he was there to share it with me. Du Bois was actually one of my dad's mentors, so I knew Du Bois well, but I did not know his economic cooperation work until Curtis introduced me to it. He also introduced me to Jim Stewart's work. Um, <laughs> and without Jim Stewart giving us that background, right, but also Jim, as a colleague, made it possible for um, Penn State Press to publish my book. He actually was very influential in getting them to actually publish it. So I'm here with thanks and honor. Um, and then Nina Banks, as you're going to hear in a minute, kind of represents what I call the where do we go from here aspect of the work that I've done. And she took my findings specifically about the strong role of black women uh, in the cooperative movement, the US cooperative movement, as community organizers and community builders, co-op developers, solidarity economy practitioners, and you'll see she just ran away with that and expanded our understanding of women in community and in the community sphere. So I'm very excited that we're all here together, that we're being taped so more people can see us. That's a copy of the book, if you don't know it, Collective Courage, History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice, published in 2014, so it's old now. <laughs> but Penn State, actually, bless their hearts, they decided that it's one of their best-selling 
volumes, and so they're doing a 10th anniversary reprint. <laughs> that should be out by May of this year. So um, they, they allowed me to do a new preface. I couldn't really update the book, but they are, I have a new preface and a reprint, so great. So I think uh, I don't need to really tell you, Jim already told you sort of what he, what he did and what he, uh, what he contributed, but really talking about how social economists can refine the notions of solidarity and social justice by looking at the black experience he talked about networks of black organizations that reinforce the spiritual context of economic development and foster that sense of national identity among blacks and reinforce the linkages between spiritual uplift and economic advancement. He talked about racial group economies that we also got from Du Bois and this new potential role for self-help vehicles to fill the void of uh, federal retrenchment, elements of this historic belief in community in order, an agency in order to move us forward as a black community and gives us that continuous legacy of economic cooperation among blacks. And Curtis, as you heard, right, introduced us to, introduces us and popularizes Lloyd Hogan, certainly also introduced me to it. Also an understanding of the internal and external labor markets in black political economy. And as I said, the Du Bois economic cooperation side and the racial group economy side of Du Bois that I hadn't known. Also this notion that cooperative economics is the outcome, right, of political economy and a practical response to human need and social reproduction and a tool um, toward this human perfectibility and an economic of, of abundance, which I'm actually embracing more and more, the more mature I get. Like Jim, I, well, I guess I'm out of high school, but <laughs> <laughs> I still feel like I'm learning here. Um, so what I want to start with in terms of my own work is how Jim Curtis and Nina's work has contributed to my current interests in solidarity economics, the economics of abundance for black and human liberation, and helping me to continue the research about the benefits of, to black communities of co-ops particularly focusing on black worker co-ops, but also exploring how co-ops that are owned by incarcerated workers while in prison can make a difference. Um, and also looking a little bit more into previously incarcerated workers and worker co-ops. So for me, I got interested in car incarcerated worker co-ops because it seemed like that was one of our, our I was going to say last vestiges, vestiges of exploitation and inequality, but there's so many vestiges that are still here that maybe last isn't the right word. But anyway, uh, an example in the 21st century of how we're continuing with slave labor, lack of control over income, uh, increased isolation and marginality, outmoded skills, unemployment and underemployment issues inability to support or contribute to family rights. So being incarcerated kind of emphasizes those problems, challenges, right? And yet at the same time, when you start to study what's happening in those examples, they provide psychosocial development, social capital formation, leadership development, in addition to economic strategies and reduce recidivism. So I've been studying different uh, co-ops in prisons around the world. The U.S. does not have this strategy unless you count Puerto Rico as the U.S. Um, and there's a really interesting model in Puerto Rico, Cooperative Aragos, for example, which is about 15 years old, though it hasn't restarted since COVID, so they're still fighting to get the co-ops um, restarted again. In Guayama Penitentiary in Puerto Rico, they started with art therapy. Uh, the artists wanted to use the co-op model to sell their art and demanded co-op education and luckily received it for free from a co-op educator from the Puerto Rican League of Co-ops. Puerto Rico actually has a very nice ecosystem of co-ops between um, large insurance co-ops to consumer co-ops, worker co-ops, et cetera, and a strong support system. So they gave, uh, put a volunteer educator, came into the prison, taught them how to start a co-op, how to do it, 
They then realized when they went to incorporate that Puerto Rican co-op law doesn't allow incarcerated people to own their own co-ops, to be on their board, and to run a co-op. So they actually got a, um, uh, met with the governor at the time, who then put them in touch with uh, national uh, state assembly members, who then changed the law so that they could own and run their own cooperative and wouldn't need any outsiders or anybody in the prison industrial complex running or helping them to run their co-op. So a really fascinating model. And when you talk to some of the members of the co-op, or actually I talk to people who were in the co-op and now are out, they just talk about that internal control, the rules of conduct that they had between each other about how to treat each other more humanely, how to work together, how to make decisions together, how to support their families through the co-op model. Um, they were able to make a memorandum of understanding with the corrections department to use the facilities, to have an office, to use the space, to bring in their materials so they could do their art, and even to have some selected members go out and sell the art. And they sold most of their art at co-op events. So again, the co-op community was very supportive. Um, and that was part of their internal rules of conduct. Who could go out and sell? You had to do certain things. If you were a parent, you had to um, pay child support while you were in prison through your earnings in the co-op. And so they had all that kind of humane ways of, of handling things. And of course, very extremely low recidivism for those who did get out, didn't go back in because of all these new skills they had. So that's sort of the new research I'm doing. Why did I think that this model would, one, be interesting to study, but also have such good outcomes? Because of all the research I had done, about um, African-American mutual aid and cooper cooperatives. So the rest of my presentation will be about sort of the lessons learned, what, it, what, it, what, we, what do we know, what have we gotten from this history in, uh, bl of black Americans using cooperatives. So we know pooling resources, anchoring resources locally, keeping resources recirculating locally. Co-ops and mutual aid do that developing collective agency and action and leadership. That was something actually the first person who mentioned that to me was um, uh, Ralph Page at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. But I also, when I reread Du Bois, he also talked about collective agency. And actually there's a great quote by Du Bois about how important that we actually, in order to resist, we realized we needed collective agency to resist enslavement and dehumanization and that collective agency to resist also uh, spilled over into our economic agency to do things as a collective. So very interesting connections there also. Providing access to quality goods and services we heard about, creating decent jobs in our community, saving costs, therefore increasing income and wealth increasing black stability and self-sufficiency, group independence, self-determination, and that allowed us to, to combat the discrimination, marginalization, exploitation that we were experiencing. Cooperatives also have helped us overcome historic barriers, right? They address market failure, right, like rural electric co-ops uh, in sparsely populated areas allow electricity Right, for instead of being a for profit venture that restricts electricity, this was a way to get electricity out to other places. Uh, access to healthy and organic food, you use a food co op, fair and affordable credit and banking services, you use credit unions and uh, co op banks. Access to affordable housing, you use housing co ops, quality, affordable child care, elder care, access to markets for culturally sensitive goods and services and arts. So um, we know that they also helped to address challenges. And here's sort of a list. Some of you may have seen this list already. Economic challenges and cooperative solutions. So really anything from general market failure to um, capital flight to housing to education to food to incarceration and climate change, right? We can see all these aspects, those principles of co-ops that um, Jim read to you. Co-ops also have a set of, I think it's another seven values, which are all based about membership, democracy, equity, participation, solidarity, that kind of thing. 
all those pieces as values-based businesses help us to address these. So I also wanted to, one of the other things I learned through this research was that when we look back through history, not just uh, black American history, but human history, cooperation was really the first economic system. And um, Chancellor Williams says that in his book, The Destruction of African Civilization. Actually, Curtis introduced me to that one, too. <laughs> um, and at first, you know, I focused on it being an alternative to capitalism. But the more I've been studying it, and the more I'm, le you know, more I'm leaning also toward economics of abundance, I think it's important that us not, we don't just see it as an alternative, but remember that it was the first system that all human beings used, right? So if you look in every population, on every continent, throughout human history, we, we use cooperation. That's our first economic system, and we need to remember that. So it's not just an alternative to the system we're in now, but it's an age-old system that we can resurrect and keep perfecting as we move forward to those seven generations of human perfectibility. Um, also, right, it connects with notions of the common good, reciprocity, collectivism, solidarity, mutual aid. We know from uh, through Kwanzaa, we just finished Kwanzaa, right? There's collective work and responsibility, uh, Ajima and Ujima is cooperative economics. So we have those principles as well. We know lots of groups have used Roscas, re revolving uh, savings and credit, or SUSU, some people call them. And so we know also that indigenous cooperative efforts from early African civilizations to First Nations here in the US, uh, sorry, in, the, in North America, all have used cooperation. And so again, we need to think about how to continue that kind of legacy. I also found that co-ops are most effective when they address needs, solve human problems using solidarity economics and collective ownership when they include rigorous, continuous education, combining populism, labor organizing, civil rights, women's rights with cooperative economics, when they're promoted by strong black organizations in the black <coughs> examples, and when they're supported by local community. So even um, when under attack, and some of you who know my work know that there are lots of examples of sabotage and even lynching of black folks for, to do co-ops, that kind of thing. It was community that supported and tried to stop the sabotage or make up for the sabotage or uh, protect the co-ops. Here are just some lists. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but to give you some example from the 1880s onwards about the strong black organizations that promoted co-ops, which we don't even think of. Some of these were also doing quote unquote civil rights work, but some of them were really focused just on co-ops or on some of those connections I just talked about. The interesting thing to me was from the 1880s, the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union is still considered the largest black organization in history, in black history, black American history. Um, and it was a labor union, a populist party, and a co-op development organization. So again, that combination makes a huge difference. Um, I think I already said these lessons learned, right? Education, study groups, and training, organizational supports, community involvement and solidarity, the democratic <coughs> participation, the sharing of power, right? And making sure the voices of the most marginalized and oppressed that's where black women also come into play, making sure people recognize intersectionalities and that we address all those oppressions. The pooling of resources so that we have access to non-exploitative resources and joint ownership, owning things matter. Women's leadership was very important in all the examples I found. Participation of youth also was important, especially for sustainability and thinking about those next generations and the effectiveness of co-op ecosystems. I gave you a little hint about that. Um, I'll skip this, but two examples of co-op ecosystems were the 1880s coalitions, and in 19, 1930s there were lots of examples. Here I have a North Carolina one, um, but also the Young Negroes Cooperative League was during the Great Depression, and that was a national federation. And so, just to conclude, right, we know that solidarity economies, including mutual aid and cooperatives, 
are the humane answer to achieving economic and environmental justice. They help us address racial, gender, and other inequities. The purpose, successes, and benefits of co-ops help us create a new social contract based on human dignity and ecological and human sustainability. Um, I said that at a UN conference last year, working on the sustainability that Jim already mentioned to you. And then this women's labor and caring work, I found, are the basis and the backbone of solidarity economies. The recognition of women of color especially will enable us to sustain and expand our solidarity economic ecosystems. And I hope that leads you into what Nina's going to talk about, because she's in very inspiring on that role. So thank you very much. Um, like so many black American economists, my path to becoming an economist began as a young person, probably in you know, elementary school, um, who looked for ways to explain and combat the glaring disparities that I saw between black and white people in my hometown in southern Pennsylvania. The obvious inadequacies of capitalism led me to embrace collective production and distribution within black communities as the solution to so many of the systemic racial inequities that I observed in housing and jobs and schooling within my hometown. I chose UMass Amherst for graduate school because I wanted to learn about socialism and I wanted to be around other like-minded students. So, oh <laughs> Curtis, Curtis started his talk with, who is this guy? i tell you about this guy. My first close look at UMass Amherst was this, was a brochure. This was a picture within the brochure. Uh-huh, yeah, we're old, right? <laughs> Not as old as, what was her name, Barbara Hopp? Oh, right. when, okay, right. June Hops, sorry about that, right? And so I saw this picture, and so I knew that UMass Amherst had at least one black student, right? So that was really good. Now, at the time, when I was in my you know, early 20s, what I noticed, I noticed there was a black student at UMass, and I noticed he's a really good looking black student. <laughs> So I dug this brochure out, and now when I look at it, I also notice, still the looks, right? But I also notice that there is a picture, yep. right, of Du Bois up on that um, office space, which I ended up sharing um, with Curtis and another brilliant student um, from Togo, Congo, Larry Longtone, shared it my first year. So there were, um, 10 black students over the period of time when I was at UMass, six of us were African American, and it was, you know, as Curtis said, it was primarily through black students that I came to learn about the tradition of radical black political economic thought within Africa and the diaspora. Having a critical mass of African American students meant that we could share knowledge and build on it something that is almost never the case in the United States outside of HBCUs. Curtis played a key role in the development of my thinking because of his insistence in elevating the political economic thought of Du Bois within a department that made no mention of the radical black tradition, but importantly, gave us space to investigate it. Black liberation, worker co-ops, Mondragon and Du Bois were topics that Curtis frequently discussed as a graduate student. He wrote his dissertation on Du Bois and the possibilities for cooperative economics as a means for achieving black community empowerment. I had a copy of Curtis's dissertation and I used it as a guide on how to write and structure a dissertation. I can't tell you how many times I looked at that dissertation. Most importantly, Curtis's dissertation enabled me to see that it was both possible and necessary to write a theoretically rigorous economics dissertation that placed the lived experiences and political economic priorities of African Americans at the center of analysis, 
as an act of restoration of a history that white Americans have overlooked, suppressed, distorted, or denied. Following Curtis's lead, I wrote an interdisciplinary dissertation that focused on the African American community. Um, I focused primary attention on African American women um, in my dissertation, which was looking at African Americans who migrated from the rural South um, into Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania during the Great Migration Era. Um, and uh, one of the most important concepts that I learned from Curtis as a graduate student um, was that African Americans had a long tradition of cooperative ethos. I didn't know that. Um, I knew that because of Curtis. And that knowledge was a thread that guided um, ideas throughout my dissertation. So I wanted to, as, as um, Derek Hamilton always says, give you your flowers. Now, we just heard Jessica discuss Curtis's role in shaping her thinking on black cooperatives. In 2007, I had an opportunity to hear Jessica give a talk at the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA, their annual meeting, um, which that year was in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I was also presenting my research. Je Jessica wrote a dissertation on, I think you're a macroeconomist, yes. right? Capital controls, all right. So by 2007, right, Jessica by then had moved her research fully into black cooperative economics, and it was clear that she had become a leading authority on the subject. Jessica's publication of Collective Courage in 2014, uh, 2014 is a pioneering work of scholarship that unearthed the long history of cooperative production and consumption within the African American community. Through Jessica's meticulous research to uncover this history, we learn of the ways in which African Americans practiced economic cooperation as a means for community survival, transmission of knowledge, and leadership development. Her research provides indigenization in that it draws on past knowledge and traditions that have been beneficial to the African American community as a guide to moving forward, and I benefited um, in so many ways from Jessica's research, from her persistence over a long period of time to unearth this um, incredible um, unseen history. Um, and of course, I also benefited from, you know, from the knowledge that she presented in her research. So my research as a feminist economist has always focused on African American women because of the important role that black women have played in the history of work in the US as women who have been the most likely to engage in both paid and unpaid work when compared to all other groups of women in our nation's history, something we don't learn, right? Um, feminist economists often look at gender disparities between men and women. Um, and either in the formal workplace or within the household. And so several decades ago, feminist economists argued that the household should be understood as a site of production, much like the firm. Um, the firm, goods and services are produced, they're channeled through the market. In the household, women um, are producing lots of goods and services, um, they, uh, those good cooking, cleaning, and so on, not channeled through the market. Um, but the household, nonetheless, um, is viewed, or should be viewed, as a site of production. Thank you. My critique of the household approach, this feminist approach that emphasizes um, women's production of goods and services within the household, um, you know, between individuals, men and women, um, who are couples, my critique, critique of the household approach is that it does not capture the unpaid work that racially marginalized, or what I refer to as racialized women, often perform for their communities. My research focuses on a particular form of work that is especially unseen in both economic theory and in practice. It's the non-market cooperative work that black women, black American women perform for their communities in order to challenge racial injustice within the United States. And so because of this omission, I developed a framework for conceptualizing unpaid work that is based on the lived experience of African-American women and our understandings of womanhood and feminism. 
And uh, my framework builds on literature on black women's community work, as well as intersectional feminist research. And I've listed um, some of the um, key um, people that I've drawn on in terms of this feminist um, literature. And I mean, their main critique of uh, feminist theories is that um, there is a tendency to universalize women's experiences based on the experiences of white, middle class, heterosexual women in the US, um, or they tend to discuss gender in an abstract manner that is decontextualized from race. Um, so in other words, um, white and elite feminist theories often neglect the role of race and ethnicity in shaping women's identities and experiences. Um, black and white women in the US have different identities as women. White women's identities have not generally been shaped by racial oppression, and so their experiences with gender oppression are largely framed around their experiences with men. Feminist theorist Aida Hurtado makes this point by saying that white women's experiences with gender oppression within their homes have led them to develop theories of women's oppression that emphasize private sphere issues between men and women. And so their focus on, their you know, critical focus on the household as a main site of oppression and exploitation. But my point, however, is that African American women's membership in racially oppressed communities both shapes our identities as women and provides a sense of shared responsibility to a community that exists beyond the private household. For African American, how about that? Having Jim Stewart as my assistant. <laughs> For African American women, therefore, our oppression as women is not just a matter of relations between men and women, but also of external matters that affect our community. So the framework that I developed um, bridges theoretical and empirical gaps um, uh, primarily within um, the feminist household approach and the social economy approaches, right? And so these are different ways of organizing economic activity. We're familiar with the market approach um, and you know, state um, uh, production of goods and services. Um, and so I've just described the household economy, which places an emphasis on individual production, typically between um, household couples, men and women. Um, sometimes same-sex couples, but the emphasis, again, is on the individual um, uh, production of non-market goods and services. Um, and then there's the social economy approach. Um, people generally are not as familiar with that approach in the United States, and there are variations, the solidarity economy and the social sol solidarity economy as well. Um, but what I found is, I mean, so the social solidarity the social economy approach focuses on collective production of goods and services, um, not primarily for profit, but instead for um, so things that are socially beneficial, right? That's what we've been talking about. But what I found is that there um, is not much focus on um, the work that people perform informally outside of organizations. So the social economy approach tends to prioritize um, collective work that takes place within formal organizations. Um, and it's not looking at informal gatherings of, of, of groups of people around a common concern, such as um, you know, the need to have clean water. Um, right, so that's a, that was um, something that I noticed was um, missing um, from uh, both of those approaches. So it's not capturing, those approaches are not capturing much of this um, non-market, unpaid work that racially marginalized women um, have historically performed and continue to perform as part of informal cooperative groups um, for their communities. Um, so, and I published this in a paper in the Review of Black Political Economy. Um, there were three objectives to reconceptualize community activism as unpaid non-market work 
to integrate that into an intersectional feminist political economy framework that elevates the community as a site of production and oppression um, and to place the community as a site of unpaid production on par with that of the household so that we have a more inclusive understanding of um, an expansive understanding of women's um, unpaid work. Because of racial exclusion and residential segregation in the US, African American women have long participated in collective endeavors to develop community institutions to combat racial oppression and meet the needs of their communities. This work often occurs collectively as a form of social activism against injustice. Because of the political nature of social activism and the informal gathering of women who are engaged in cooperative efforts around a common concern, people tend to overlook these activities um, in pursuit of social justice as concrete forms of work. Um, and again, my argument has been that these non-market activities constitute work, unpaid non-market work. When scholars have focused on black women's community activities, they have primarily described it, you know, historically as racial uplift or self-help, more so than as unpaid women's work. Du Bois, for example, commented on the importance of black women's unseen community work in 1924. Quote, the women of America who are doing humble, but on the whole, the most important effective work in the social uplift of the lowly, not so much by money as by personal contact are the colored women. Little is said or known about it, but in thousands of churches and social clubs, in missionary societies and fraternal organizations, in unions like the National Association of Colored Women, these workers are founding and sustaining orphanages and old folk homes, distributing personal charity and relief, visiting prisoners, helping hospitals, teaching children, and ministering to all sorts of needs." End of quote. Um, and so what I would say is that since then, black women have continued to engage in grassroots activist work about which uh, little is said or known. Um, and a lot of this work tends to increase during periods of crisis. Um, so black women's unpaid community work is a response to a long history of racial exclusion and racial harm from the effects of state and or market activities on black communities or the and or the insufficient provision of resources by the state and private sectors. It includes black women's cooperative work in response to Jim Crow, racial segregation, or racial apartheid, in response to economic crises such as the Great Depression, as well as within the environmental and food justice movements, um, or in response to food insecurity during the COVID pandemic. It occurs when black women collectively challenge the harm done to black children in their local school systems. And I'm not going to go through any of these, but I just want to, you know, show that there are, you know, some examples of black women's unpaid collective work. Some of them I talked about in the article and some I haven't. The Atlanta Neighborhood, um, the Atlanta Neighborhood Union, 1908, um, again, black women informally gathering to um, address unmet needs of a growing black population within their city, city officials, white city officials ignoring those, those needs, and so black women taking upon themselves to um, go house to house conducting surveys of community needs, fundraising efforts, um, you know, build, you know, uh, collecting money to build um, in, uh, organizations um, to gather materials for playgrounds and so on. Housewives Leagues of Detroit during the Great Depression. Um, one of my favorite is, and I didn't talk about this in the paper, is the AKA Sororities 1935 to 42 Mississippi Health Project. How many people are familiar with that? Right, really important. Um, AKA Sorority, and again, informal gathering of women, they're not being paid for this, it's volunteer efforts, um, and they um, mobilize a health unit, I think it was the first mobile health unit in the United States, they take a group of women um, into Mississippi Delta, um, they gather the support of black physicians and nurses, 
um, and they provide health services and health screenings and immunizations to black people in the Mississippi Delta, many of whom were sharecroppers, had never had any um, medical services because of the system of racial apartheid, right? That's just one example, and that's just a little bit of what it, you know, of some of the unpaid work that they did over summers from 1935 until 1942. And again, it's overlooked. Um, we have not been thinking about this as um, you know, unpaid work that black women have been performing on behalf of our communities, but it is. The Women's Political Council, Montgomery, Alabama, um, uh, in terms of civil rights efforts, um, sustaining the Montgomery bus boycott, again, voluntary efforts involving unpaid work. Um, aid to needy children, Mothers Anonymous, um, women who lived in a housing project who were teaching each other um, um, important information about um, aid to families with dependent children and their rights as tenants. Um, the environmental justice movement, as I said, is an area where we see a lot of activism um, uh, uh, for, um, uh, on the part of African American women again, and their role has often been overlooked, although they have often been leaders in the environmental justice and food justice movements in the United States. Um, re more recently, the Coalition for Education Reform, a group of um, uh, black mothers in Delaware, um, protesting and trying to um, organize against the dumping of black children, primarily black boys, over a 10-year period um, into a special needs school that was a separate school, um, which was, um, you know, a, pr pretty much a dumping ground for them. Um, and um, other racialized women in the United States have also um, long been active in producing collective unpaid work on behalf of their communities. I'm not going to go through that, but in the article I theorize these activities as unpaid work within an intersectional feminist political economy framework, and I argue that this unpaid community work should be elevated on par um, with household unpaid work since it is generalizable to marginalized women globally. So I use the example of African American women because I'm most familiar with it, um, but other racialized women in the United States um, have also engaged in um, cooperative, um, informal efforts on behalf of their communities in response to um, forms of oppression, racial, racialized oppression. Um, but we also see it globally um, uh, as well. And so finally, um, when I presented this analysis a few years ago, Jessica asked a great question, and her question was, well, what are they producing? Uh, and so my response was that black women's unpaid cooperative work produces collective goods that are socially beneficial to the black community, goods such as clean air and water, safe neighborhoods, and racial justice. Thank you. We think of something, we can jump in. How about that? Yeah. Beautiful. I had the opportunity to be mentored by Frank T. Davis, and uh, <coughs> a gentleman that was the first African-American on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve. Now, Frank T. Davis, to a T, you know, it's the black community and all. He is the first draw research, one of his draws, research director for the Johnson and Johnson, you heard of Edmund E. Right? He identified the expenditures that the black community uh, made Johnson a very rich man. So it's suspending uh, well I think about uh, uh, James Brown. I don't want nobody to give me nothing, right. open the door, I get myself. Right. Now, right. the, now, the cooperative model, and all the reason why he's not here is more than that. Well, that's a cooperative model, right? There's a lot of What I like you guys to say, we're in a new age economy where you have to function of applied knowledge and applied technology. See, I've seen people going to 
bro. Now I could come out of it. Very different. Yes, yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, but not a I'm aware of you. I'm facial and eyes. I'm going to have to do this. And uh, so, you know, everything is very helpful. It's helped. But now we see we're on that information highway. We went on the side of the road. You know, you got to bring it in too because it's, you know, because uh, if you're not part of it, then it, the new age economy will be gone. I'm emotional right now. Thank you. Um, uh, soon. Well, yeah. All right. And uh, I'm glad the work you guys are doing. But I'm a big man of imagination. Imagination is a profoundly cold. A great imagination, a great idea. All of us are bounded by a delta imagination because it is it's pure for me. Maybe I'm wrong. Move, move, move. Um, I, mean, I mean, you're absolutely right about the extent to which spatial issues are no longer uh, sort of primary constraints. But, but the type of networks that I'm talking about don't require simply spatial uh, dimensions. If everybody doesn't have to live in the same area to participate. You can do it. You can do it online. In terms of Frank Davis, I, I still have his book, uh, and June Hops model was generated by her reading of Frank Davis's book. So, so, so clearly Frank was a very important progenitor of talking about the type of de Walker, development. The, the evolution from sure. the identified, uh, yeah. well, yeah. Jim mentions Frank Davis, talks about Frank Davis in his article, and the paper that he wrote for this presentation. Well, I was at the Federal Reserve had an opportunity to be the assistant to the uh, board member. And uh, he said, you got a PhD from Howard, you got a, a BA from Howard, you got an MA from Howard, you got a certification for support to get there. He said, uh, where do you want to go? Do you, do you want to be, I said, I want to be a economist. He said, uh, but you got your BA, MA from Howard, so uh, you want you go, so I said, my car, Howard or Harvey? beginning you talked about yeah the, the spatial issues and I thought you were getting at the fact that we're now in a digital age and what does that mean and I just wanted to say there is a whole uh, platform cooperativism 
movement now also to talk about how to own the digital platforms, the software, the platforms, the apps as a collective in a cooperative way, especially to address um, gig economy and gig work for workers. So that so we are already, there's already a way to apply this co-op ownership in the spatial digital world. Um, but it also reminded me that one of my favorite quotes from Du Bois is about, I think his was from 1930 or something, he said, you know, we're now entering a new industrial era and black folks can use cooperation, economic cooperatives, to um, make sure we're at the forefront of that movement. And I think we're in the same space now, right? This, we're in another new era, right? New industrial age, but we can still become, take it, be in the forefront of that movement, especially, again, if we use humanist cooperative economics to do that. We can again, instead of being the mules of society, instead of being the mar on the margins, we can be in the forefront. I think, uh, Sue, you had a question? I'll pass. You'll pass, okay. Patrick? You had a couple of slides that I thought were <coughs> immensely important. One was the quote by Du Bois, and the other one was the, the, the women in Detroit. Uh -huh. Can you pull those up? Sure. Why are you doing that? Um, the, the, the largest black employer, I think, in the city of Tallahassee is a church. Right? Uh, which is a not-for-profit institution. It is a co-op. And, and a libertarian would say has a very uh, ill-defined ownership structure. You basically, when you join a Baptist church, you own it. Mm -hmm. And when you leave, you're not going to own And the day you join, you get as much ownership right as anybody else. In particular, the church is thinking about own a retirement center, one or two restaurants, a mental health facility, shopping center, right? And they provide lots of other services. So in that particular quote right there, if you look like scattered in there, and he's talking about these women, he says in thousands of churches and social clubs. <coughs> and Du Bois was an atheist. But he recognized the importance of these churches. And Manny Marvel in his book on how capitalism undeveloped by the church showed how the, the, these churches are intimately connected to other institutions. So that, again, using Tallahassee, two, two of the, the city's uh, community centers, they're city owned, so they're technically not a part of the church, except they are. Because the people who run them uh, officers in the local church. And so the board of directors who help raise fundraise, who help raise money for these community centers, all church people. So Okay, let me let me let me respond really quickly to that, just that point that you're making, right? Um, because years ago I was trying to gather information, I was trying to quantify black women's unpaid community work, looking at the American Time Use Survey. Um, you know, going through various ways to try to capture it um, and reading literature on volunteerism among African American women and the numbers were always very low and you know and the literature says that black women often engage in volunteerism through their church and what I ultimately concluded is that African American women um, often don't see this as work in any way shape or form um, because it goes through, it's often through the black church, and as my cousin, who is a black church lady, um, says, it's just service to them, right? This is service, and so they don't think about this, many black women don't think about this as work, as unpaid work, because they see it as service. And so, on the NEA list, 
I remember years ago, you had a, you talked about your involvement in your local church, which is in Florida, and you listed all the activities, and I copied that, and I, yeah, and I've used it, right, in my research, looking at all of the things, all of those activities, because they, black women are often, the black women are the backbone of the black church, and so a lot of the activities that you were describing uh, constitute unpaid work by black women. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely a lot of work. And yes. It, and it's unpaid, and it's a female dominated institution in terms of the work. Not necessarily in terms of the formal position of power, but every black pastor, pastor with brain knows, do not mess with the gray haired women or else you do not have a job. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, but what has, so in, in thinking about cooperatives, that is the single best example of cooperatives since the end of enslavement, right? Because these are not-for-profit institutions. And I'm always amazed when people talk about rotating credit associations and all that. Well, most black churches don't do loans. We just give people grants, they're small grants. You, you got a problem paying your, your utility bill, come to church and give me money. It's a guy who needed, like at our church, he needed tools and just got a job. He only needed about 30, 40 bucks to buy tools to come to church and give me money to buy tools. During COVID, we laid off no one. Even though we were not formally needed, everybody got paid for the job that they normally do, even though they weren't doing it, because the church had a commitment to making sure that they had an income even if they were not working. So you got to incorporate that. I mean, maybe for the people doing it, they do it as service, they do it as for God. But you know, as an economist, it's work. And it's very successful work, and it's an example of what can be done. You know, people often say, well, it's got to be for profit. Look at that, the biggest black employee in the city of Tallahassee it's church. Bill Diggins' old church used to have a credit union, right? And then going back to your paper on community as a site of production, well, who's doing the producing in the black community? And in terms of where people meet, most of the facilities, if you want to meet somewhere in the black community, the facility that you meet in is probably a church-owned building because that's who owns most of the building. So we need some data gathering and needs maybe some thinking about how to take advantage of all the financial resources that are raised there. And also to call attention to, hey, this is actually economic activity. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of economic activity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you? Uh, I would just say, you know, Jim did it too, because in his 1984 article, he talked about the role of the church in, in creating CDCs and that kind of thing through um, Sullivan. And I also talk about, because Du Bois also talks about how even co-ops started out of churches. And I, uh, a couple of years ago, I actually wrote a little article about black churches and co-ops and that kind of thing. So I think you're right that we need to understand, you know, churches are places where human beings come together and do things. <laughs> you know, I often, I used to hesitate because they were so dominated by, by the men and kind of hierarchical in terms of leadership, but then they're decentralized in terms of practice, right? Who does the stuff? So it's that interesting dichotomy. The thing, you know, I always, when I was focusing on co-ops before I kind of expanded a little bit more, I was excited because co-ops have that mandate to be more democratic. Um, and so I was interested in how, right, how do we get the democratic part? How do we get that agency for everybody, the more participation? Um, but I think you're right that it's interesting to look at the ways that, um, the roles that churches play in all of this solidarity economics. We've got a lot of questions out there. I, I, there was a hand up over here first. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, so I have a question regarding 
I guess, way forward for um, the fact that women have this, maybe black women in particular, have this triple, maybe quadruple burden um, of um, activism uh, in the community. So as I see it, there's kind of two causes. One is white supremacy, and the other is patriarchy. I know that they're really finely like intertwined, um, but I was wondering how you target or how you would frame a solution if it's more targeted toward um, gender equity um, and uh, kind of the liberation of women in that way, or uh, acknowledging the privilege that black women have over black men access and safety in doing this kind of community work and kind of targeting white supremacy and liberating black men in, in a sense uh, to be able to step up into these types of um, types of community activism or community building work. Because um, I see it as both. In a sense, there's um, greater access and, and um, availability for black women because of the ways that black men have been stripped of their power and um, uh, say, personhood um, in America, in the United States, um, and also uh, interracial, like intrapracial, um, gender dynamic uh, that women are, are made to carry the front of, of those responsibilities. So I was just curious how do you frame a way forward um, in that regard? And your question is for me? Yes, primarily for anyone. Okay, so in my, you know, my focus on cooperative efforts um, is looking at it from a negative standpoint, right, in terms of this burden that's been placed on black women because of patriarchy, white supremacy, anti-blackness, capitalist exploitation, um, which is different, I think, from um, uh, the vision, right, of empowerment that we get from the scholarship of the three other people who are on the panel. And so, um, so why women? Women are often the ones who are um, inclined to um, um, address problems that they perceive as affecting children, right, more so than men. Um, and I think that, you know, it's not so much a matter of you know, men need to step up or black men need to step up, but that there's so much harm that's been done to our community that a lot of black men are not in the community to even be able to address many of these harms that are, that are taking place, right? Because of mass incarceration, you know, it's just one example. So what I always hoped to do but never got funding was that I was going to do particip um, participatory observation of different racialized communities in the United States to try to quantify the work um, that they have been doing, um, indigenous communities, Asian American, you know, so I, there were eight different communities. That's what I was going to try to do um, and, you know, to look at it in terms of um, the kind of work they were performing. Um, the quantity of work, right, and, you know, possibly, you know, look at it in terms of uh, contrib contribution to GDP, but it's a negative, so it's not adding and subtracting, right? That was always what I had envisioned that I would do to this. Um, but I think more importantly, it's calling for, um, I, you know, what I want is a paradigm shift in how we think about unpaid work and also how we go about um, understanding um, production in an economic framework, economic activities broadening it. And can I just follow up? Would the, would the angle be um, uh, recognition or compensation or spreading that, spreading that burden to other communities? Yeah, there shouldn't be a burden. So that's, the, for me, the underlying um, premise of this is that um, you know, it is negative work, right, often because it's in response to things that are harmful to the African American community, whether it's toxic waste dumping in our communities that causes cancers, or asthma, you know, high asthma rates because of toxins in the environment, um, or lack of whole foods, right, so it's always in response to something negative. That's the approach that I, that I was taking. So 
it's to call attention to the harms. Plus, police brutality, right, right, would be an example of it in terms of black women mobilizing against that. So get rid of those harms and threats. Um, and again, uh, the vision, right, that comes out of cooperative efforts from the scholarship of, of Jim and Curtis and um, Jessica is a way forward to, you know, address the pressing needs, right, of our community as well as empowerment. Yeah, I was going to say, I actually, I totally understand what you're saying about the burden, but I've always seen it as resistance as agency and not actually as a burden, but it's another way to assert ourselves as human beings and to assert our agency in the face of horrible harms and injustices and exploitation. So for me, seeing, watching, uh, documenting women's agency in community, in co-ops, in economics, to me is something, to me it's freeing even though I agree it's exhausting and now I'm, I'm, I'm actually reading uh, Rest is Resistance and trying to figure out how we, you know, how we also rest even though we need to resist, you know, resist. So, um, so yeah, so I felt like, you know, and for me I feel like I understand women's roles both as resistors and also we're technically in charge of the internal labor sphere and social reproduction and so it's all part of our responsibilities there and again it might be unfair an unfair burden but that's how I explain that activity and for me the way forward is to both is to recognize to make it less invisible mm -hmm. right I don't know that we need to pay it but we need to value it Right? We don't value it enough, and then we need to figure out how to democratize it so it isn't just women's burden or women's responsibility or that kind of thing. But the other thing that gives me hope is a study I read about that was done in Emory in like the 90s, I think, on um, cooperation and endorphins. And they actually were studying the endorphins of people while playing the Prisoner's Dilemma um, game theory game, they found that everybody got higher endorphins when they cooperated, but women got even higher and more sustained endorphins when they cooperated. And so for me, that's another thing that get, makes me excited about this, like, you know, that actually not just that we're agentic, but we actually can get joy from doing this. I, I found that in, in my own research on cooperative economics and, and the, the great cooperators, a lot of them live very healthy and long lives, and I think the endorphin concept. And, but I'd also say that what Lloyd Hogan does, from my perspective, is that he introduces this concept of what he calls the institutional mechanisms of social reproduction. And I would kind of consider myself as a micro-political economist. And generally, microeconomists, they kind of focus on the firm, the production function associated with converting inputs into outputs. But as a micro-political economist, I recognize that, that the traditional mainstream looks at the household as a site of um, uh, household behavior and consumer behavior and this whole idea of consumerism. But what Lloyd Hogan has done is he also understands it as a production site. Uh, he calls it the internal labor process. And what's produced in that internal labor process is the human being. And those human beings, right, you know, you're born as a child. Those human beings that are around that child, they influence the growth of that child. And so switching the emphasis away from the, the, this, the, the status quo of profit maximization, cost minimization, to recognizing, like, for example, a language that we use is the idea of, of uh, personal productivity, right? And personal productivity being the degree and quantity of significant accomplishments that can be attained in a particular time period that reflect your, your dreams, your goals, your values, your aspirations, right? That's productivity. What can you do that within a particular time period? So shifting away from traditionally, like we know, we know what, what the production function looks like. 
you got, uh, you got output as a function of labor and capital, entrepreneurship, but there's also a production function in what we call, in mainstream economics, calls the household, but what Lloyd Hogan calls the internal labor process. And we are the product of our, our, of our energy. Also what he adds, what I feel is important, is that, again, most of our language, neoclassical economics, whether are Keynesian economics or Marxian economics, we focus on labor, but before labor, there's energy. Right, human energy, and I think that it, where we're moving towards this this dematerialization concept, moving from uh, 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 Newtonian physics to quantum physics, new, moving towards uh, digital uh, digital forms of value, whether it's human value or whether it's monetary value. Certain people who are in the Bitcoin energy talk about Bitcoin is monetary energy, but where does monetary energy comes from? It comes from human energy that manifests as monetary energy. But where does human energy come from? Well, the universe is energy. We are a particular manifestation of, of energy as human energy. So the answer is, is that, well, let's change the framework. framework. Let's, let's stop looking at scarcity. Let's stop look, looking at the negative. And I mean, I'm, I don't even want to be preaching that context. I feel that it's just good science, right, to, to look at socioeconomic development from the positive, from the idea of, uh, of abundance. Yeah, my, my take on this is, gets back to the question that, you, that uh, Jessica asked you, what, what's being produced? And what black women are producing is a collective identity and community stability, and that's a, that, that's a positive good. And what we need to do is to provide supports to, to leverage the efficiency that they've already produced so that, they, so that they, the burden is, is lessened and the output is, is increased. Mm -hmm. yeah, question uh, Billy has had a question for a while, and I told him to yeah. do Thank you very much. Uh, I have a quick question for Curtis yes. and for the high school prodigy. <laughs> 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 uh, and then we'll get to, and then you, your question. And you had the question. Okay. It'll, be, it'll be very quick. Uh, uh, Curtis, uh, I've tried to uh, find Lloyd Hogan's book, Principles of Political Economy. I went to Amazon. Uh, for some reason, they, they won't allow me to purchase it. Uh, so I'm sure I'm the only one in the room that has never read Principles of uh, Political Economy. But I would like to uh, read it since I didn't read it in graduate school. Do, do you have a, another source where I can obtain a copy of the book? Um, and while you're thinking on that, well, I'll let you respond, then I'll go to that high school prodigy uh, <laughs> next year. Okay, so, so right now that, that book is, is um, out of publication. But we do, like I think Ed Whitfield has got the, the, the publishing rights to that. Um, uh, Khalil Mohammed in the back, We're, we are working on a project to, uh, to um, do an audio book of Lloyd Hogan's work. So, you know, go to our website. We're, we're going to make sure that that book gets out. And also make sure, make sure we transcribe it. We're going to make sure we transcribe it Try also. Try powells.com. They might have a used copy. Oh, okay. Powells. I think I bought a used copy at Powells. I bought a used copy on Amazon about two, three weeks ago. Really? Uh, for a student. Oh, and did I mention that my student thinks Jessica is the GOAT? <laughs> <laughs> he also, he went, he's reading Lloyd Hogan, and, yeah. you know, around yeah. the clock. Um, and then you have a question for the high school student, you said? Yeah, that, that, that high school uh, apology <laughs> there. Uh, uh, Jim, I'm currently uh, doing work for the NAACP in Washington State as a chief economist, they mm -hmm. tell me. Uh, so uh, can you offer uh, any specific guidelines? Because the NAACP in Washington State is interested in uh, co-ops, cooperative economics. Uh, in, in particular, uh, but um, I know very little. Uh, I need to read just a good book, as well as Curtis. But uh, can you offer some uh, some strategy that the NAACP can uh, can use in terms of uh, you know making this a, a part of our economic justice program? That's what it's falling under. Yeah, it's it's little known that in the 1980s. The NAACP developed an economic development program when uh, Benjamin Hooks was the executive director and, and uh, what's her name, uh, 
uh, was the chairman, uh, I'm, bl I'm blocking her name, she was chairman of the board. So I was still at Notre Dame at that time, and I was the, the chair of the Indiana State Committee for Economic Cooperation for the NAACP. What Hooks wanted to do was to establish a national committee, but Margaret, Margaret Bush Wilson was the, was the uh, CEO. She wouldn't let him do it. And so that, that's when they sort of moved away from that as a, a, a part of their strategy. But I think that the NAACP is well positioned to play a vital role in the, in the cooperative movement. And I think one of the ways that we could do that is we could augment the earning, I mean, the, sort of the, the uh, membership fees to do something that's similar to what Sullivan did in terms of then using some of those, those funds locally to build some of the type of enterprises that we're talking about. But I'd be more than happy to work with you to, 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 okay. to do that. Yeah, Thank you very much. Also, okay. Bill, there, there's um, not so many black groups, but there's a bunch of worker co-op associations in Washington State. Um, I'm working with the Black Prisoners Caucus. We're trying to do uh, co-ops for their members inside and outside prisons with, through the Reparations Law, which is a, a nonprofit in Seattle, which is doing worker co-op development. Um, and then um, the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops actually has a project with the Urban League to do conversions of black businesses to co-ops. So that's another thing they might think about. Yes. And sorry, there was one last question in the back. Oh, yes, I am. I am uh, glad you guys are going down this road. This has been my, uh, this has been my field of expertise and, and passion. And uh, uh, Dr. Curtis Stewart, I'm gonna give you all some insights on where we're going because uh, I went to the government and Fair Reserve. I'm in finance, investment banking side, so. The elite universities really don't have finance. It's really a, a young field. It's always in the business schools and that sort of thing. Right. They have a little uh, financial economics that you all have on the economic side. <coughs> they put in, I mean, Yale's got that. Finance is really what it was about. Now, when the government says, listen, here we pay three million up at the time, 40 million black folks, we don't need you. What we need is our own money, our own right. capital. We're seventh largest nation in the world, black people. We're bigger than County, your largest trading partner. So my proposal was to the treasurer was give us our own currency. So I developed it. And they were just steaming, you can't do it, you can't do it. And I just didn't give the history. Capitalism is based on black bodies. If you couldn't have mortgaged this, you wouldn't have America. Okay. I'm just give the history, right? The United States never had money. The money came from the bank. So I had to get this then because they call it secret service on me. That's <laughs> <laughs> now I'm giving the history, right? So now they approve it. They said, listen, you don't have to come to DC. Go to, it, you go to the attorney general. I'm back to Chicago. They approved it, but then they gave me the uh, runaround. I had to go to the attorney general. Attorney general said, ah, it's a secret service. You go to secret service across the street. Well, they approve or I approve it. Meanwhile, and I only went to it because I had already printed it. And the friend wanted me to get, get the government approval because he prints for the government. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> but what I want to tell you, I'm going to move forward. We we'll move forward, okay? Because that got approved on anything now, I think the, the black brains got scared. So, but they changed the one all I printed. They're like, I'm doing 70 million a month to get a black book. They're like, give me all you want because at the end of the day, the Fair Reserve came up because now I am more like them. The Fair, I told them, the Fair Reserve not a central bank. I mean, I mean, do we all know? It's a private bank owned by the bank guys. They print money, they got a contract for the government print it. The treasurer print do the same thing, they do and save all this money. The treasurer print the money right now and have no interest rate. That's why the politicians said, why don't the treasury print one trillion dollar platinum coin, then we won't have any debt. You see what I'm saying? Because that's the government, the Fed is not the government. You see what I'm saying? But anyway, let me move forward. I like your project, uh, Mr. Stewart, what you put on for her, uh, your, your network model you want to use. Mm -hmm. So we gotta change that to a network model. So we're like information theory now. That's what Facebook is, that's what Google is. It's a network model. So everybody touches that, these kids touch that, it didn't grow up overnight. You don't want to do the 70 mile. And now for Curtis's 
you're perfect. You're just saying the same thing, but we're moving toward abundance. Tomorrow I'm going to announce it in Black History Month, February, because we're doing a national African American Monetary Authority. This is who I'm pushed out because my, my, uh, my money's already in security exchange and registration right now. We're going digital money. We don't want to fool with crypto or Bitcoin. There's no place in Black America. Period. Well, I, I would disagree with that. Well, I, well, I, I'm, well you can disagree, man. I, yeah, yeah. I was there. We found it. So I'm yeah, trying, I'm trying yeah. to tell you it's a government thing. It has nothing to do with what they're talking about. It's can I interject here, sorry, and say that we're at a time, we're over time. Okay. Maybe but we'll we can have a conversation, this conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. Out, yeah, out, outside. Thank you all for coming. Right.